three and just one verse. Verse number 36. <clears throat> John chapter three and verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Let's read that again. This is a verse that has been of uh, unmeasured blessing for people who have entered into its simple truths. I, I'm just going to say this by the side. Among my most intimate long-term friends, more people that I know have been saved through John 3 and 36 than any other verse in the Bible. Now that may just be my experience, and I'm not expanding that to people that I don't know. But among my close friends, this is a verse that has been an immense blessing to them. I'm pretty sure, I'm not going to do it, but if there were a show of hands here tonight, I'm pretty sure there's some people in this room that came to know the Lord through the truth of this verse. Let's read it again together. John 3 and verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John chapter 3 is one of the most remarkable chapters in our Bible. And one of the reasons I say that is because it contains some of the, I was going to say best known verses. I think we've got to move away from that language because unfortunately in our world, what was true 50 years ago where people knew verses from the Bible has large, largely vanished, unfortunately. But it would be my ambition and my heart's desire that you would come to know the great verses in John chapter 3. They're like skyscrapers. You know, the Bible's a marvelous book. And it, it's filled with uh, just tremendous worth as God speaks to us through his written word. And yet there's something about John chapter 3. It's like driving up to Toronto or, or driving to New York City. There's just skyscrapers that, that leap upward out of this chapter. Take, for example, John chapter 3 and verse number 7. You must be born again. And I've got to move on to the next verse or I'll end up preaching on that all night. And you know what the next one is, don't you? It's John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm glad I learned that sitting on my mother's knee. When I sat on the other knee, I learned a little chorus. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You wonder why I love my mother? That's one of the reasons right there. No, that's actually two of them. John 3 and 16, and Jesus loves me. I think the third great skyscraper in John 3 is the verse that we have read at the end of the chapter. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I, uh, I like technology, and uh, I like all the advancements that uh, we've seen in our lives. And I, I think I've said before many times, uh, technology can be used for good or it can be used for bad. Uh, like almost everything else that I know of. Uh, but, you know, there are some advances in technology that are, are, are really phenomenal to me. One of the things that I would be very loath to give up is uh, uh, what's on my dash. It's a, it's a GPS. It's a global positioning system. And it doesn't matter whether I am in the United States or in Canada or whether I'm over in the UK and Scotland or England or wherever it might be in the world I go. That, 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 that little machine is absolutely amazing. You know why? Because it knows exactly where I am. You see, I'm not so interested in a GPS telling me where to go. I'm interested in finding out where I am. Because unless you know where you are, you'll never be able to calculate how to get where you want to go. It's of 
just inestimable value for people who are traveling. I want to tell you tonight that you and I are all travelers on the road of life. All of us possess, all of us are never dying souls that are traveling through time and traveling through this world and we are traveling toward eternity. And before I ever begin to speak to people about where they are going, the most important discovery that you could make in this meeting tonight is where you are right now. You know, it's an interesting thing to me that there are some opinions that we pick up based on what we see around us. Let me, let me see if I can uh, just explain that to you. Here in Canada, there are a few people that are absolutely incredibly wealthy. I don't know how many billions or trillions of dollars that they have, but you read about them in the paper or you read about them on the internet or you see them on TV. And, and they are people and their wealth is just unimaginable. They're in the upper, upper, upper class. And, and you and I might aspire to a few things that they might do, but honestly, it's, it's completely out of reach. There are other people, I guess I should have used the U.S. maybe as, a, as for my message tonight, but there are people here who are very, very poor. And I'm sorry to say that in a wealthy country like Canada or the United States, there are some people who have nothing. And we can argue about whether that's their choice or whether it's a culture or whether it's capitalism or whatever you want to argue about. The fact of the matter is, is that while there are some people who are unimaginably rich, you can't wrap your head around how much they have. There are some people that are unimaginably poor, and I can't wrap my head around how little they have and still live. But you see, we are very comfortable thinking about a third class, aren't we? That's us. No billionaires here tonight. But nobody who didn't have a meal today, and if you didn't have a meal because you couldn't afford it, come see me after the meeting. I'd be honored to buy you a dinner. But the fact of the matter is we're just comfortable right in the middle. Do you know when it comes to spiritual things, there are people who think that what is true economically is true spiritually. I wish you could come with me and listen to some of the things that people say. They say, well, Mr. Schott, you know, uh, I, I'm not like the people who are incarcerated in the penitentiary. I've never committed a felony in my life. I'm really just not as, you know, there's just some people and they're just rotten. And, you know, they, you know I, I'm not part of that group. And then they usually sort of smile at me and they say, but you know, I'm, I'm no Mother Teresa either. I, you know what they're trying to say. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. I, uh, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't claim to be a, a holy person or a, or a particularly righteous person. Uh, I'm, I'm not up there either. Uh, I'm not down there and I'm not up here. Where am I? Well, I'm just kind of in the middle, and it makes me happy, and it probably ought to make God happy. Here I am. Take it or leave it. I hope you don't mind me just saying this as bluntly as I know how. That's why I love the Bible. That in all the noise and nonsense of a world that has forgotten God, it's a relief to just turn to this holy book and see what God has to say. So I want to look at John 3 and 36. So don't look at me, look at your Bible again. And um, let's see how many classes of people God sees. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. I'm not a math major, but that's one. <laughs> and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Two. And... I hope you just noticed that there's not a comma, there's a period. And this isn't an English lesson, but that's important. Because what I want to convince you of tonight, and very straightforwardly from the kids in the front to adults in the back, is to leave you with this impression. 
You are in one of two groups before God. You either have Christ as your Savior, or you do not have him. And there is no middle ground. I, I know that that may make some folks very uncomfortable. It pushes them out of the comfort of their thinking and of their philosophy, of maybe what they've heard in other religions and other, uh, and other things. But this is God's eternal, unchanging word. And God looks down into the human race, and he looks down into the gospel hall in Sarnia, Ontario, and he says, you are one of these Two, you have the son, or you do not have the son. I, um, I guess I don't mind stopping right now and just asking you a question. Which of those two groups are you in? Boys and girls, teens, adults that are here? Do you have Christ? Or are you still without him in your sins? I went with a dear friend of mine. This was very vigorously brought to my attention. A friend of mine took me to see an exhibition of um, relics, I guess that's the word, from the Titanic. Yes, has that come to Windsor? I, I, I hope it does someday. It's, it's worth seeing. And if it's anywhere nearby, go see it. And um, I think you all know the story about that great uh, ship that, that launched from the UK and was coming over here. And uh, it, it struck an iceberg and it sunk in the Atlantic Ocean with the loss of many, many lives. I'm not gonna entertain you with the details of what all is in that museum. Although I will say this, one of the most poignant things there was a suitcase that they had actually lifted from the depths of the ocean. And when they opened it, you know, the, the, the man's stuff was all just, just the way he put it. His shirts were folded and his razor was there. And I, I don't know, you know, there was something about looking at that that personalized it, right? This isn't a story. These aren't statistics. This is about a real man who lived and died that day when the Titanic sank. And I'll tell you what, it, it kind of grabbed me at my heart. The thing I remember the most as we were about to leave that room, there was a large display on the wall that had the names of every single person that was on the Titanic. And over the one column, some of you know what it said. It said lost. And on the other side, it said, saved. Tragically, there were more people in the lost column. And I think it reflects the reality of our world tonight. Lost or saved. And I'm not trying to be a complicated preacher tonight. I want to be as simple as, as God will help me. Are you lost or are you saved? I want to tell you, if you could discover where you are tonight, the road to heaven would be made very clear to you. You know, a man said to me one time, he said, it must be really hard to see people saved. I said, no, it's easy. He looked at me like I had two heads. I said, the hard thing in the gospel is seeing people lost. Because I want to tell you, if you understood that in your sins, the wrath of God was hovering over you right now, you would be, to use the language of the men who taught me how to preach, you would be in a hurry to be saved. Is there someone here that would like to be saved? This is what we were doing in the prayer meeting just before this meeting started. Praying for you, some of you by name and asking that God would awaken you, that God would open your eyes tonight to see where you are, saved or lost. And I'm going to just ask it again. Pardon me for being so simple. Are you saved or are you lost? 
I want to look at this verse just for a few minutes before Mr. Fraser gets up and just tell you three things that I enjoy from this verse that maybe will help you to understand God's way of salvation. I want to speak first of all about the, the marvelous joy of knowing Christ. That's how the verse starts. I didn't pick the order here. Actually, I'm going to follow the order that the Lord Jesus gave this verse in. Because he said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. I, I want to tell you tonight about the great joy and relief that comes when you trust Christ. I remember buying my first car. It wasn't a Model T, so don't ask me afterwards, but it was a, it was a 1967 Chevrolet Nova, and it was used, and one fender wasn't quite the same color as the other one, but uh, I purchased it for the incredible sum of $1,200. The difficulty was is that I didn't have $1,200, and my father would not give me the money. He said, you have to learn what it's like to go down to the bank and borrow the money. Well, I was terrified at the whole process, but at the end of the day, he co-signed the loan. I got the $1,200, and I bought my, my very first car. But, you know, I didn't get the joy out of it that I thought I would. I thought, having a car, that's the ultimate, man. I'm, I'm just the coolest thing on four wheels, and, and this is going to be great. Except for one thing. The fact that I owed the bank $1,200 hung over my head every single day. And the joy that I anticipated from it was tempered by the fact that I owed a debt that I knew I was going to struggle to pay. Fast forward to the end of the year. I think I took out a loan for 12 consecutive months, $100 a month. If anybody wants to sell me a new car for that, uh, talk to me after the meeting. But, um, uh, you know, I, I will never forget. It's just so vividly seared into my memory. The day I went to the bank, this is before paying with the Internet and with your phone and all this stuff. And I went to the counter or I went to see the bank official and I handed over the last $100. And he pulled out the contract that I had signed, and he got a big red stamp. Never forget it. And he stamped that piece of paper. Do you know what it said? It said, paid in full. Now, I know we live in a society that doesn't seem to be bothered by debt and other things. So I'm not going to address that point. Here's what I'm addressing. I just cannot begin to tell you the relief that filled me when I knew that my debt had been fully paid. Now, you don't have to be much of a gospel preacher to apply that, do you? Because I want to tell you that I was a sinner who was deep in debt. I was a sinner who had fallen short of the glory of God. And the difficulty that I had was that the thing I wanted so much, which was the forgiveness of my sin, was something that I was incapable of producing. And I thank God for the night that in his mercy he showed me that the Lord Jesus had done everything that I needed, everything that God needed for me to be saved. And I just, in simplicity, just said, well, if God says it, you know, that's just going to have to be good enough. And I know that salvation is not about feelings. We talked about that the other night. You don't get saved just because you have some little shudder goes through your body or some little fireworks that go off in your brain. That's not God's salvation. A lot of other things can cause that. But I want to tell you when you get saved, it's the greatest feeling in all the world. Feelings follow facts. Feelings follow faith. Don't ever get the order mixed up. And I want to tell you in the darkness of my lostness and my sin, there was the massive relief of knowing that my debt was fully paid. You know, a lot of years, about 50 years, have gone by since I paid off that debt. And you know something? Nobody has showed up at my house. Nobody has sent me an email that says, Mr. Shutt, there, there, there's something, you know, you didn't quite get it all paid. 
It was paid in full. The debt was discharged, and I am forever free of it. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to be saved? wonder if you ever think about what it would be like to be saved. I used to think about that before I was saved. What would it be like not to be carrying the, the guilt of my sin? What would it be like to come to a gospel meeting and not worry about dropping into hell? I want to tell you, those are real things. And if you're not saved here tonight, I hope that this isn't just an hour's entertainment. I hope that you'll be thinking about your soul and where it will be for all eternity. But just let me tell you, at the very beginning of the meeting and at the very beginning of my message, it's a grand thing to be saved. You know what? I've been singing that hymn all my life. And uh, my kids tell me that I'm not a good singer. I think they told me I have a voice made for tent meetings. I don't know what that means, but um, it's some of you do. Um, but it's, it's not good, that's for sure. So I just sing to my dashboard, hmm, it's a grand thing to be saved. And to know it too and to show it too, it's a grand thing to be saved. A couple of years ago, I went to the Billy Graham Museum down in North North Carolina? North Carolina. And um, the thing that I enjoyed the most is I walked into a room that had a lot of black and white televisions all around the room. And what they were playing were sections of old messages that Billy Graham gave in his, in his campaigns, in his revivals. And as I walked into the room, there was one that was speaking. And this is what Mr. Graham said. He said, a person who is saved never regrets it for a single moment. Hmm? There are people in this room that have been saved 50 and 60 and 70 years. They've been saved a long time. And I could bring every single one of them up here to the front. And they would testify to the fact that it's a grand thing to be saved. That there are no regrets. There's no second guessing. Nobody who is truly saved ever regrets it. For a single moment, the marvelous, massive, incredible joy of knowing Christ. I just have a couple of minutes left. I didn't mean, mean to spend that much time on it. But you know something? If we cannot, as gospel preachers, tell people how good it is to be saved, why would people want to be saved? God's salvation is more than a fire escape from hell. God's salvation is to enter into the embrace of the grace of God who has loved you from all eternity. And a God who wants to show you grace in this world and in the life to come. And I love the words of Paul. I was just reading it today in the book of Ephesians that in the ages to come, he will show the exceeding riches of his grace. It is kindness through Christ Jesus. There will never be an end of grace poured out in all its magnificence and fullness for those who are trusting Christ. You come to Christ tonight. You come to Christ. Because you see, there's something else in the verse. I'm just going to touch it, and I'll let Brother Isaiah maybe carry it a little further. But the miserable consequences of missing him. You know, it's wonderful to talk about the joy of salvation. It really is. But I want to tell you, it's a dreadful thing to think about missing this great salvation. Did you listen to what this said? Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You know, here in the Great Lakes, we have some interesting weather patterns. I, I'm sure you noticed. And every once in a while, there's a big storm front that rolls in here over southern Ontario and over Michigan where I live. Normally, the weather just blows through. You know, it's headed for New York and headed for the Atlantic Ocean. And every once in a while, there's a storm system that just parks itself. It hovers here. And day after day, it's snow or rain or sleet or whatever it is. It just, it hovers and it doesn't move. L listen carefully to me. For those who live in their sins and die in their sins, for those who step out from life and into eternity 
without a savior. That's what this is saying. The wrath of God is going to hover over them for all eternity. You know, there are a lot of bad mistakes that we make in life, and we just redo, we just have a do-over. We get a second choice. We get a second chance. We have another opportunity to maybe invest our money differently or to take a different job or, or, or go somewhere else for vacation. But the choice that you make about what you're going to do with Jesus Christ, I'll tell you, it could be a permanent choice. And for those who refuse him, the wrath of God abideth on them. Let that sink down into your soul. Is there anyone in this room who would like the wrath of God to abide on them? May God awaken you to your danger. May God show you your deep and profound need of Christ as your Savior. May God impress upon you the massive responsibility that if you are lost tonight, that you must trust Christ if you are ever going to know eternal blessing. Let me read the verse again, and I'll sit down. May God fix this upon all of our hearts. If you're saved here tonight, let this verse sink in. It's a great verse. If you're not saved, it's a good verse for you too. Whoever believes in the Son has everlasting life. They don't hope for it. They don't wish for it. They don't dream about it. They have it. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him.